Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's kind of getting late, and I'm trying to be brief. Now, I'm delighted to be here uh, to talk about climate-driven sustainable development goals, the case of Taiwan. Uh, in fact, this title was given to me, so I'm kind of trying to accommodate as much as possible and come up with a uh, relatively successful presentation. While I'm here, while I've been selected as a speaker for this afternoon, I think basically my background is international relations uh, under the framework, I mean in the Department of Political Science. So strictly speaking, I'm a political scientist. And what political science has anything to do with climate change? So I started working at the Ministry of Science and Technology many years ago, um, responsible for international affairs. So, and I started pushing and promoting for the global uh, climate change program. Uh, so for over the years that I become, you know, getting involved in different multidisciplinary uh, research projects, uh, doing uh, recently a uh, community-based adaptation. So here, Kampan, so I attended this uh, project uh, where I met a lot of social uh, social scientists, including sociologists like Professor Ku and the Koichi here. Uh, then, uh, more recently, I joined this uh, uh, TICAT, Taiwan Climate Change Adaptation Technology uh, Projects. I'm more in interested in institutional dimensions, uh, public participation, uh, than uh, the, the framing of the climate change. Uh, so, my topic is pretty much on community-based adaptation. Uh, for the university uh, system of Taiwan, that's, we call it Tai Lian Da. So, I'm the more, the, more or less the focal point for the science, technology, and society program. Uh, for the past two years, and I've been involved in this e-coast research program. Actually, this is a, uh, a large program for the coastal research. Yet, altogether, we got like 10 PIs. Everyone is doing like geology, uh, like uh, ocean chemistry, ocean physics, tidal waves. No one was doing governance. So I was there as the only social scientist involved. And for the last year, and I was doing the governing of PM 2.5. Uh, I'm not interested in the model itself, especially all these uh, climate models or the air pollution model, but it's more concentrated on the disclosure of environmental information and how this information being translated into uh, decision-making process. Uh, starting this year, hopefully I could continue to conduct this research for three years. It's linking NDC and uh, sustainable development goals. But if you really Google me, you know, that's how you know someone nowadays. Then you're going to find most of the uh, notifications and items are about climate change negotiations. Uh, since COP13, then I started or I have been bringing graduate students to COPS for the past 11 years. So, uh, this is not supposed to be here. All right. Back to the climate change. The climate is changing and it's happening. If you really look at the climate change on record, uh, the Five uh, hottest year on record all have come in 2010s. That's here, see? starting right here. So we've been talking about last year, that's 2017 was the hottest on record. And then if you start looking at here, starting like 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17. 
They're all here. But if you really look at the the top ten hottest years, top top uh, top ten hottest years on record again, they all have come in since 1998. Remember, this is the year for a very robust, very robust El Nino year. And then if you look at the hottest, I mean the top 20 hottest years on record again, they all have come in since 1995. So we're, you know, if you feel hot, this is not illusionary. If this is not in your impression or illusion, this is the real fact. I got to pay some attention to the year of 2015, and this is the year of significance. In March, that we passed here the Sendai framework on DRR, disaster, disaster risk reduction. Okay, this set up all the DRR framework from now till 2030. So this is a global 2030 agenda. Then in September, at the 70th General Assembly of the UN, here again that we launched the Sustainable Development Goals, SDG. The sustainable development, in fact, is being talked about. You know, we hear this big buzzing word a lot, but this is a big idea and often ambiguous. But nowadays, we come up with goals, specific 17 goals, and then 169 indicators. So it's become much more operationalized. Uh, then, climate change summit. That's in December. Now we had the Paris Agreement. So all together, you know, so the way I see it, the year of 2015, especially under the UN framework, at least three streams of environment development issues are now converging. And this is taken from the UNFCCC uh, official website. Now, if we're talking about key elements of the Paris Agreement, uh, there are at least one, two, three, four, six of them. If you look back you know, throughout the entire climate change negotiation process, there are four major pillars throughout the negotiation process. So they are mitigation, adaptation, finance, technology. But nowadays, if we want to use only one word to describe Paris Agreement, I would say it's the bottom-up approach. So unlike all the other previous agreements, such as Framework Convention on Climate Change and then the Kyoto Protocol, now the Paris Agreement, we have something, I cannot say new, but it's much more expensive. So we could look at here, we have a temperature goal. We've been heard about this 2 degrees C a lot. We try to limit the rise of temperature to two degrees C above the pre-industrial levels. But now we have saying we add one more word, pursue efforts to 1.5 degrees C. That's why the uh, most uh, authoritative expert group titled IPCC, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and nowadays are commissioned to draft a report on the pathway to get to 1.5 uh, degree C. We also have another thing which is left out here from now till 2020, because the Paris Agreement would not start until 2021. So from now till 2020, so what we've been doing here is to encourage all the climate actions and then including the non-party stakeholders. This is a new term that we have to pay attention to. Non-party stakeholders. What we are referring to here? It is non-party. Why they're here? This is 
not specially written for Taiwan, but we are kind of delighted to see this, right? Non-party, to be a party, then you have to be first to sign this treaty. And secondly, it has to go through a legislative process to have this treaty ratified. So after signing and the ratification of the country, I mean, usually it's an independent state, they will become a party to a particular agreement. So here, throughout the Paris Agreement process, that we actually welcome non-party stakeholders, such as cities, the sub-state actors, such as business sectors, uh, such as civil society actors. So they're all included here as we are giving a kind of official title, non-party stakeholders. Uh, let me see. Loss of damage, what the, this is, I cannot say something new, but it's attached to adaptation concept here. So loss and damage, this is being fully and officially recognized for the first time ever. Uh, let me flip. If we really look at the timeline here, so Paris Agreement was signed 2015, okay, in December. And then the treaty entered into force uh, a year from then, so that's November 2016. And all the way, so we started having the, the conference of the parties to the Paris Agreement. The move, that was last year in Bonn, uh, COP23. That's the, the 23rd conference of the parties to the UNFCCC. As I mentioned earlier, that the IPCC, the expert group, is now drafting and launch a special report. This is called 1.5 report. And that was last year's big fancy word. It's called Talanola Dialogue. It's really, this is the process, we're going to come up with the work program or the implementation details of the Paris Agreement. And coming up in December, the early December of this year, the COP24 will be held in Poland. So this is the timeline. And it's going to be held in a coal mine town called Kato. I'm not too sure about the Polish here. Temperature goal, as I mentioned, not only 2 degrees C, but then 1.5. The exact wording is here. Pursuing efforts to limit the temperature increase to 1.5 degrees C above the pre-industrial levels. Uh, this is, we call it, pre, from now till pre-2020 climate actions. Uh, the global stock, that's another thing, you know, in order to assure the international audience or the final outcome, we are having a global stock taking. So this is uh, the one that we are kind of taking the inventory of the current status, so we are now we know for sure that what we are moving toward. Ah, one more last thing that I would like to stress upon is the human rights dimensions of the Paris Agreement, and this is the first time ever that in official wording that we have seen uh, the climate change be associated closely with human rights uh, dimensions. Now if we read carefully the text from the Paris Agreement that you can see from here, the respective obligations of human rights, the right to health, so we have health here, the rights of the indigenous peoples, now we have indigenous peoples, local communities. So here we are 
as a citizen for the public engagement in all the environmental make, uh, decision making process, we could fully engage. This is, you know, special listed as the local communities, migrants, children, persons with disabilities, and people in vulnerable situations. And more importantly, we are acknowledge, acknowledging that the right to development. This is specially written for the developing states, as well as gender, equality, empowerment of women. And it's most comforting for me to see that, because being, I've been working closely with the youth groups. This is the word I would like to see, intergenerational. Last year, the, the Paris Agreement or the Climate Change website that that's the first time ever issued an annual report. This is something new that I would encourage you to take a look at this report, listing up to now, uh, up to now outcomes and then uh, listing the role of cities and some other encouraging views. If it's climate-driven sustainable development, then first of all, all the 17 sustainable development goals should include climate change. Yes, so it's here. Number 13, climate action. Now remember, this Sustainable Development Goals is actually built upon the eight, the eight Millennium Development Goals. So it's kind of expanded from eight goals, Millennium Development Goals now is into 17 goals. And this is actually the, the graph that we usually see. But, I myself that would like to see the wedding cake approach. Other than just green blocks, then it's kind of in layers. So it started built upon with the biosphere, so the climate is here, and then from from the wedding cake all the way to the society. See, so that's the education, uh, the equity, the food. And then all the way to the economy, you know, number eight, that's the, the green growth, uh, job opportunities, and this is a sustainable consumption and production. And then look at the candlelight. The candlelight here is the number 17 goal, partnership. To put this alternatively, then, it's the 5P graph that I like as well. So other than that 70 goals, you can see it's really the 5Ps to illustrate the SDGs. So we have people, planet, prosperity, peace, and partnership. It's kind of individual yet integrative. If you take a deeper look at all the SDGs, then you can know that it's not only 70 goals, but we have targets in the time frame to go with. Okay, so it's all together with 169 targets to reach. Number 13, climate action. Under the goal 13, there are detailed targets five of them, and then this is the year, the timeline. Then if you look at how individual, how or how this being globally okay, responded, then you can see for each country, for instance, this is the Thailand, and this is Sudan, and this is uh, Sudan or Uganda, and each country are writing their own NDCs to respond to the to all the 17 uh, listed SDGs. There could be individual goal like the goal 12. 
Or it could be a sector, which is cross, cross different goals, such as transport sector. So for transport, it's not listed as a particular goal, but it's kind of cut across with different goals. So the transport sector kind of redefines how SDG you know, relates to the transport sector. And then the business sector is also got involved. So you can see the com we come out with different assessment tools, you know, like 10 principles using like labor, work environment, and all that to have business sector's practices responded to or related to SDGs in the world. For Taiwan, then we have you know, a policy guidelines here. And then, so far, I think it's most interesting to see that we use SDG as a pathway to back to the UN. So the first time ever that you can see our Minister of Foreign Affairs saying that, you know, despite our efforts, da 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 da. So this 23 people, of Taiwan cannot be left behind. Then if you really zoom into what's there, then you can see the Taiwan's development goals here. Again, it's listed. This is the UN 17 goals. This is the listed is what we be responding to or the real concrete program or initiatives. Be careful. So far, what's unique is, it's not only 17 goals, but we have number 18 goals here. <laughs> to me, it's, I cannot say, well, I would say it's unique, but it's rather awkward. Now, we have developed goal 18, is establish a nuclear-free homeland by 2025. This is, we call it, Fei we make it the number 13, no, number 18 goal under the framework of SDG, which is quote unquote unique. Uh, to me, this particular goal 18 could be easily incorporated into climate action, no? or into the SDG 7, which is energy. Okay, time's up. I'm gonna flip. This is another step that we've been doing that we drafted and issued the Voluntary National Review to assess the progress or to update or to showcase what we've been doing so far under the framework of SDG. So you can see this is our minister, uh, the general director for our EPA, the Yiyuan Shu Zhang. So he visited the New York City and then kind of uh, make, a, make a lecture and then issue the DNR. This is the content of the DNR. Back to this nuclear homeland or the Thinking Initiative, we really look at the energy portfolio. You know, this is the target that we're going to move on. 30, 20, 50. Now, this is the current status now. Uh, the nuclear is actually, you know, uh, makes up like 12% of the old total energy portfolio. So then we are going to increase largely on the natural gas contribution. And renewables, this especially worries me because the renewables are now it's like around 6%, minus hydropower, it's about like 2% for now. And then by 2025, it's going to reach 20%. And this is the thing we could talk about later. I attended a workshop, I think yesterday or the day before yesterday, we were talking about this community-based or community old, uh, community uh, governed uh, power plants. 
And then this is the process. It's quite lengthy. If we really talk about how engagement, that we should be, you know, have at least one particular element is the co-design. You know, the general citizens or the all the stakeholders have to be included from the start very point when the policy policy design stage. And not in the end, we always be invited for this, you know, like the government sponsored Xuan Dao Hui. So in a way, you are there to be informed. And then please respond to the draft. Okay. So it should be co-design and then co-delivery all together. And this is the way I see it. Maybe I'm spending too much time, but let me conclude right here and we can open up for more discussion. Thank you so much. Professor Liu Xingqiu has the overview of the, the SDG and uh, Taiwan's uh, attendance uh, in the national. Actually, you know, at the. Uh, that, that's uh, in China. Yeah, Professor Liu Xingqiu introduced uh, that the SDG 7 and the uh, 13 related to energy transition and climate governance. And uh, we, I noticed that, that uh, the particular Professor Liu Xingqiu also mentioned that the uh, uh, energy. Uh, ratios, yeah, it, uh, policy, energy policy uh, in different countries. In Taiwan, our new government uh, uh, set uh, the goal uh, uh, 50, 30, yeah, this one. 20, yeah, yeah, this one, yeah. in 2025, uh, 50% of our energy, 30, coal by 20, the renewable energy. And in Seoul, I remember that in South Korea, that uh, there Target in 2013, uh, they try to arrive to 20 percent renewable energy. Mm -hmm. Japan, the same, about the same target. Yeah, yeah. yeah so it's uh, mm -hmm. yeah, so it's uh, related to the energy transition. So as I mentioned earlier, that uh, actually in I don't know what about that in very As I mentioned earlier, that uh, actually. If we review the progress of energy transition in this region, so these three countries, even Philippines, actually launched energy transition to that, to that, yeah, to that. And what is actually the 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 reason? Yeah, one of the reasons in our this in our this book published, yeah, in 2000, and in this our new book published this. At the, the, the beginning of this year, so we call energy transition in this area. We try to explain the the the, the problems and the structures. Uh, we actually we suggest that, that uh, maybe we can have to notice the, what uh, uh, the uh, nuclear region and, and uh, in the governmental yeah, sectors uh, yeah, in in this in this in this region. Of Different countries, and so now, so the three countries started to try to you know engage more the energy renewable energy. But as our colleague asked, it, that the renewable green energy has just sometimes had a conflict with the ecological yeah uh, development. And so I think this is a balance, yeah, and uh, also a challenge to, for us to to, to go further. And uh, on the other hand. Uh, in this country, at least uh, in Taiwan and in Japan, we try to actually decrease or base out nuclear power. As I know, the South Korea try to decrease the nuclear power yeah, by the new government. So we actually have some very similar pictures yeah, yeah, in between. So I think this is actually we have to notice that uh, Professor Liu Xing mentioned this. Uh, so we open to the floor to give uh, some uh, questions to Professor Yuqi. Any question? Okay. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Ho Jin. Uh, today, uh, you stressed uh, the importance of the year of 2015. Yes. And. Uh, 
uh, you said uh, three streams uh, disaster reduction uh, uh, yeah DRR uh, and uh, SDGs and uh, party agreement yeah these three streams are now converging yeah this is very important message to the audiences uh, but uh, uh, but uh, you uh, talked about uh, SDGs and uh, climate change uh, today but uh, how about uh, uh, DRR and other uh, two streams? Okay. DRR is concentrated pretty much on the disaster risk reduction. To me, it's either climate change driven or water resources driven. So the climate change so the logic goes, the climate change will change the rainfall pattern. So it's either too little or too much, or too intense. So you have changed either drought or the flooding, or you have other you know, weather extreme events, or the rainstorms plus landslides, uh, or the intense, the way we call it, a prolonged heat, wildfires, public health impacts. So that all related to when it, you know, when we say climate change is usually a creeping phenomenon. When we say climate change, I mean, if I say for the past 100 years, the global uh, temperature mean has increased 0 0.74 degrees, you say, oh. Any, I have anything to do with that? No. But if when it comes in the form of disasters, then it's become acute. That will open up the policy windows on the policy making process. And the field's pressing is something that they have to deal with right away. So the weather patterns, Climate change, extreme events, change in rainfall patterns, water driven, I mean water resources driven, it's either too little or too much or too late or too intense. That will lead to, or at least it works like a multiplier to make the natural hazards much more, what, either robust or the intense or more frequent. So it's all together, that's why I say, again, in terms of time frame, and then this DRR is the roadmap, is the global agenda to 2030. Sustainable Development Goals 2030, Paris Agreement 2030. So this is, the UN actually undertakes a very ambitious global agenda to end to end poverty, hunger, inequality, along with climate change, public health, education, the green growth, uh, energy. So remember that wedding cake approach. So we have the planet, and then we have the society, and then we have the equity, and then the partnership. It's all together. And then gladly, finally, we have the the concrete targets and uh, goals all together. Otherwise, you know, you feel, oh, sustainable energy, what that means. Or sustainable consumption, what that means. It's hard to implement. This is such a big idea. As I've been offering classes, uh, seminar on sustainable uh, development for three years now, both at the National Central University and at the National Zhengzhi University. So it's been well received. Because when we say sustainable development, they will say, oh, good, but then so what? It's hard, it's hard to, you know, to, what's the word? Uh, it's not tangible. 
high sounding word. So the natural disaster is another kind of twisted phenomena requiring right away immediate attention in terms of policy agenda. That it opens up the policy window and it gives a sense of urgency to deal with it right away. So it's not just warming, but it's forest wild, wild fires. It's not just dengue fever, but it's the widespread of the public health impacts. It's not just rising of the sea levels, but it's the evacuation of the coastal communities. It's acute. So it kind of works on the other end, works like a multiplier, and then demanding immediate policy responses and then emergent uh, responses. So that's a hard question to respond to, though, by the way. Any, any question to Professor Nancy? Uh, going back to the chart of the uh, the, uh, the non-nuclear homeland, mm -hmm. yeah, 2025. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I think that that chart is very important for Taiwan. And uh, but um, related to, in terms of climate change, I would like to know the, how Taiwan predict the CO2 emission and the reduction between 2016 and 2025. Uh, because uh, the nuclear-free homeland should be good contribution to the climate change. So I'd like to know the CO2 reduction between these two years. Okay, this, this then for that, it's being officially written in our INDC. That's the, where is NDC? Gosh. Because I started with a, like 45 charts, you know, slides, and I say, oh, that's too many for 20 minutes talk. So I reduce all the way to, uh, let me see. Okay, I give you the numbers. So it's by, uh, it's in Chinese, Taiwan's NBC. There's, that's the, that one is being what? Deleted? Oh, okay. Okay, the target is, again, we use the business as, against the business as usual. Okay, so we have to look at our NDC. So it's against the business as usual level, it's going to be minus 30% by 2030. To me, it's not ambitious at all. And it is... Minus 50% against the business as usual levels. So business as usual, when I say business as usual, we usually build in a like 5% in, uh, the increase rate. So the business as usual in terms of energy demand is going to go like this. So we say we are going to cut down our emissions. So it's like, what? It's it looks like a big achievement, yet if we really use 2005, 2005 as the base year, the situation could be quite different. So it's a playing around with numbers. Uh, can we make Taiwan NBC connected? Or it is connected with the internet? Yeah. Oh, okay. Go find out. Zelda, Taiwan. So we have our NDCs listed as part of, you know, I think the lead agency for this is our EPA. There's another thing which I'm concerned is about our government transformation. Because you know that our EPA will soon become the quote unquote the largest government agency for the cabinet is going to add like some departments from the uh, economic affairs, from agricultural, from forestry and all that. But if you really look deeply, 
the water resources is not coming. Yeah, look at here. This is, this is the magic formula. We say, by 2030, we are going to cut down 50% of our, above, again, what base here is the business as usual level. And the economy-wide and all that, this is pretty standard. But for me, that year, we use, we have to change the base year, not as business as usual, to show the large decrease. I'd rather, I rather want to see the 205 level, where it's relatively much higher. It is harder to achieve. But you can read all this, page two. Yeah. So here, usually we need sign, I mean, scientific input. According to my understanding, my best understanding is actually our EPA is all just to add numbers from all the sectors, like energy sectors, from the economic affairs and other and transport as well. See, in the future, the lar the sectors with the largest uh, growth will be the transport sector. But so far, our transport sector seems to be very laid back. They haven't really done too much yet. That worries me. Other than this energy sector that we know, for sure. Energy, and then we usually associate climate change and energy. So this is back to this, what I call it, social framing of climate change. We consider climate change equals energy. If I'm from the least developed state, I will consider climate change as an equity or a climate justice issue. Okay, that seems to be. But this is this is the thing. I think we somehow uh, we we have our you know like we make efforts, but it's not a big. Uh, the, con the concluding point is is not ambitious. Thank you. Okay, so. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, So we move to the general discussion. Just now we invited the whole speaker to go to France.